Okay, we're up and running. So tonight we're going to be looking at um, the Last Supper and the Farewell Discourse, or Discourse Says. We'll have to talk a little bit about that issue uh, uh, as we get into it. Um, but uh, just to recall where we were last week and how we're getting into the thing tonight, um, uh, the narrative flow started at the beginning of chapter 11 when Jesus uh, heard of uh, Lazarus's illness. And um, at that point, there was a, uh, a verse that pointed forward to chapter 12. Uh, they note that uh, Mary anointed the feet of Jesus, uh, anticipating the story that we get in chapter 12. Then we had the encounter with Martha and the encounter with Mary, a nice little diptych. And then we had um, the raising of Lazarus himself and the reactions, another little diptych. So the diptych principle or the balanced episode principle uh, seems to uh, have been operative uh, through chapter 11. And we've seen that uh, on numerous occasions throughout the gospel. Then we have a little bit of a transition and then the story about Mary anointing um, uh, the feet of Jesus. And as I was suggesting um, uh, last time, basically what we have here, I think, is um, uh, a Johannine version of the same contrast um, that Luke used between Martha and Mary, even though there's something positive to be said about each one. Uh, what we have here is uh, Martha recognizing the significance of the coming death of Jesus, and the whole of the gospel is pointing toward that. So this is just a reminder that uh, in the last episode that we were looking at, celebrating this sign of the resurrection of Lazarus, there's also this strong pointer toward the passion, toward the cross. And that um, uh, should be a, a hint at uh, what's going to be coming today. Um, so after uh, the events in, in Bethany and the raising of Lazarus, uh, things develop in Jerusalem. Um, and the crowds react to the raising of Lazarus and the high priests and their um, cohort plot against Jesus. This is all very much in Johannine language and uh, picking up the momentum of the narrative as, as it's been built into chapter 11. Um, and then Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Uh, and this scene is familiar because the elements of it are uh, stuff that we have heard in the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of Mark and uh, the parallels in Matthew and in Luke. And there's a scripture, uh, pair of scripture texts that are cited, Psalm 118 and Zechariah 9. Um, all of this is familiar stuff. So John has picked up something from whatever source he's using, I think the Synoptics, uh, and framed it with the uh, material about Lazarus um, that... Um, has come from the previous episode. And then the crowds react, react to what? To the raising of Lazarus and the Pharisees uh, continue their plotting. So we have a nice little framing device here around the entry scene with uh, its familiar notes and the note that mm, Jesus is coming as, as king. Oh, well, uh, we need, gonna need to think about that in due course. Then we get another um, little diptych, if you will, with um, some particular Johannine themes. In chapter uh, 12, verse uh, 20 and following, we have uh, the Greeks seek Jesus. And Jesus declares when he hears that the Greeks are seeking him, the hour for his glorification has come. Um, the notion that the time of the passion is the hour of Jesus is um, not new. This is something that um, comes to John through his tradition. Uh, probably from Mark. We find it in Mark 14, 41. Um, but John builds it in a major way. And we've seen him referring to it ever since uh, the Cana episode where Jesus was talking about his hour not yet coming. Uh, but now it's come. And why has it come? Because Greeks have come into the picture. And who are these Greeks? Are they Greek-speaking Jews who are coming to Jerusalem to worship for the Passover? Uh, or are they Greeks who are outside of the realm of, of uh, Israel? Are they proselytes? Are they um, folk who are uh, not part of the traditional worship of Israel? Not entirely clear. And it's probably another one of these cases where um, there are multiple meanings involved. Uh, in terms of the narrative setting, it would make sense to talk about Greek-speaking Jews uh, coming to the, the Paschal uh, festivities. In terms of the overall um, trajectory of the Johannine uh, narrative, uh, we're going out to the world as the hour comes. And so when the Greeks are there, the hour has come. Um, the other part of this uh, diptych is um, Jesus at prayer. 
And um, it's interesting that in the Gospel of uh, John, there is no uh, story of the Gethsemane uh, event of Jesus in agony. Uh, but Jesus tells us um, when he begins this prayer that his, he's troubled. And many people see here a, uh, an echo of the Gethsemane story put into a Johannine framework. In any case, uh, Jesus prays and um, uh, prays a psalm, Psalm 6, verses 4 and 5. And the Father answers. Uh, there's a voice from heaven, as there is in Gethsemane, and as there is in the Transfiguration, um, you know, in all of these scenes where there's some sort of epiphany of uh, the divine will over Jesus. It's here at this moment as the hour is dawning that the Father speaks. Um, uh, Jesus asked the Father to glorify his name. This theme of glory comes up again, and we're going to talk about that just a little bit more. Uh, this recalls um, the name theme, too, that we saw in chapter 8, where Jesus declares himself, I am, uh, echoing the, um, the, the various forms of the divine name, especially in Exodus, but also in Isaiah. And it also anticipates uh, the reference to the divine name that we're going to get in chapter 17, the final prayer of Jesus, which kind of frames the whole uh, business of the uh, Last Supper and the farewell discourse. So um, we have one of these themes that run through the gospel. There were so many themes that run through the gospel and they achieve a certain prominence in some place, but in each uh, location where they do appear, there's some sort of connection uh, with the way in which the theme has been deployed before. And so Jesus, having presented himself as the divine name, now uh, presents himself in the moment of glorification as the name in a very special sense. But what is the name and what does it convey? One can ask. And that's, uh, I think, where the gospel is trying to push us. What is it that Jesus is conveying in this moment of his hour, when the hour has come, the hour of glory? In any case, there does seem to be some, uh, at least, um, casual allusion to the agony scene uh, that we have in the synoptic gospels but jesus is not sweating bloody sweat as he is at least in some texts of the gospel of luke um another little diptych the, the crowds question jesus uh, about the son of man since the term has come up and jesus um usually as uh, we've often seen in the gospel responds in a way that uh, doesn't quite fit the question, right? He's always pushing people out of their comfort zone, and the comfort zone might be defined by the language that they're using. And uh, here he echoes another one of these themes that has been so prominent in the last several chapters, ever since chapter eight, but had already been anticipated back in the prologue, that he is the light. And he tells people, you want to know about the Son of Man? Well, walk in the light. So what's, where is this light, and how do we find it? And uh, what does it do to us? Um, we get um, a, a kind of um, ironic reaction to what might be our question at that point in the next little episode, the second part of this little diptych um, in chapter 12, verses 37 and following, where Jesus uh, interprets um, a text from the prophet Isaiah uh, about the hardening of hearts and the like. And at the end of that, Jesus cries out that I am the light. Um, the citation of this, this text and um, the way in which Jesus frames what he's talking about here in terms of the motif of the light, I think is, is quite interesting. Uh, the text talks about um, uh, uh, blinding and hardening of hearts. Um, and who is doing the blinding and hardening of hearts? Uh, one might think it is God who does so. And if one thinks so, then one would come to a highly determinist view of what's going on in the fourth gospel. Uh, people are destined uh, to believe or not believe. And as I think I've suggested a time or two before, I don't think that quite works. I think there's um, uh, a realm where human uh, decision is, is uh, required in reaction to the invitation to be in relationship to God through Christ. And I think John recognizes that. So what is he doing with this quote? Um, uh, the he who's doing the blinding is not God, but the uh, referent of that pronoun is the one who is speaking, and that is Jesus. Jesus is doing the blinding of hearts and hardening of hearts, and how does he do it? Why? By being the light, by shining so brightly in the eyes of people that they turn away. 
Why do they turn away? Because they don't want to see the light. It's up to them. They loved human honor rather than the glory that stands in front of them, is the answer, the Johanna answer to the question of why it is that some people believe and some people do not. It's their responsibility. It's not divine determination. So uh, I think it's a mistake to read uh, a kind of uh, strict um, Calvinist um, uh, set of presuppositions into John. John is playing with these categories. He knows the debates about divine determination uh, or divine sovereignty and human freedom. And he comes down on the side of uh, human freedom and responsibility. Um, but he knows that people are reacting negatively to Jesus as well as positively. And it's Jesus, therefore, making possible that decision or making it required that leads to the blindness that some have. Um, and uh, to drive the point home, um, and also to raise yet another paradox, we have uh, the Jesus affirming that he judges no one. So he's not in the position of determining the outcome of um, the confrontation between himself and humankind. That's up to people. He does not judge. It's their actions that uh, produce judgment. Their own decision does so. So. Uh, this little episode, I think, is, is a very important one for some of the theological concerns that uh, are on the table or in the periphery uh, around uh, the fourth gospel and uh, what it's doing with uh, its notions of, um, of grace, of provenient grace, to use an anachronistic term, um, and of human freedom in response to that uh, grace. Uh, so this is all chapter 12, uh, setting up uh, the scene for what happens next, and that is um, the Last Supper. Um, but this chapter uh, pushes in a very strong way the theme of glory. And I think we need to review that just a little bit to remind ourselves of the paradoxical claim that uh, John is making, that the Paschal event, the uh, crucif death, the horrible death of Jesus on the cross is actually a moment of glorification. Remember, we've seen from the, the um, prologue, uh, the notion that um, those who hear this, the, this gospel and believe it have seen the glory of God. Um, and we know that um, uh, the spirit is not yet given according to chapter seven, since Jesus has not been glorified. So the glorification of Jesus is the uh, necessary condition for the infusion of the spirit, which will happen a little later on in the gospel. Um, that um, makes people into a, brings people into a relationship with um, God and Christ. Uh, Jesus had affirmed in the middle of his um, declaration about his being the divine name uh, that culminates in that declaration that he does not glorify himself. Uh, the Father does, and how does the Father glorify Jesus? One might ask. In any case, the theme is there, and the whole business about uh, the raising of Lazarus was there, so that the Son of God, Son of Man, and the Son of God might be glorified. Uh, so glorification has been a theme that has been pushed throughout um, the gospel, and those are just some of the episodes where it appears. It also appears in connection with the evocation of the uh, suffering servant passage in Isaiah 53, where the servant will be exalted and lifted up. Exalted or glorified uh, is uh, the Greek term, and lifted up. Um, the term that uh, John also uses in many places, uh, beginning with the uh, allusion to the serpent on the staff of Moses in chapter three, who is lifted up and seen by people to uh, bring them healing. Uh, and in connection with the uh, initial hint at the divine name in chapter 828, uh, that when he's lifted up, says Jesus, people will know that it is I or that I am. Um, and in chapter 12, uh, the material we just uh, skimmed over, uh, he echoed that theme again. If I'm lifted up, I will draw all to myself. Ah, the Greeks have come. Ah, I'm being lifted up. I'm drawing people to myself. Yes, it's all happening, right? And in John 12, 34, the Son of Man must be lifted up. So being lifted up is to be glorified, to be seen in a way that transforms human existence. Why does it transform human existence? Because it involves the glory of God. And here John is evoking the Old Testament motif of the divine glory, um, which uh, we find in uh, Exodus, uh, the devouring fire on the mountain um, is a, an apparition 
of uh, <clears throat> majestic awe inspiring power and that's what the glory of god is it's a fire that melts mountains uh, according to the uh, psalm psalms 29 and psalm 97 the glory of god in the old testament is something that that is hidden but also revealed hinting at what goes on in the uh, use of the motif here uh, as applied to the uh, the passion of christ hidden yet revealed how does it get revealed sure enough it's hidden all right doesn't look very glorious at all to be hanging on a cross and bleeding and uh, suffocating to death. Um, but the notion that the glory of God is hidden yet revealed, we find in the Old Testament in Exodus, uh, where the glory is in the tabernacle behind a cloud. But we know it's there. Why? Because the word of God has uh, let us know. Or Ezekiel, who sees a mysterious human figure, the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. So one gets to the glory of God secondhand um, in the vision of Ezekiel. Um, and Ezekiel has the notion that the glory returns to the temple when God's promises are fulfilled. Uh, God's presence is in a renewed temple. And yeah, indeed, we know that John has the notion that uh, Jesus is in some sense the renewed temple. Uh, we know that from the uh, cleansing of the temple episode, right? And according to Isaiah, the glory of God is revealed, revealed by the servant of God. And that's certainly what John has uh, been up to or is going to be up to and what happens in the, the Last Supper. So I think John has meditated long and hard on the theme of the divine glory as it pops up throughout the, uh, the uh, Hebrew Bible and uh, uses it as, in probably inspired by the passage in Isaiah as a way of talking about the servant and what the significance of his death is, the moment when the glory of God is somehow revealed, hidden but revealed. Okay, So all of this is important for what's uh, going on in the, um, the Last Supper and the uh, farewell discourses and eventually in the Passion story itself. One other little dimension that uh, is going to be uh, influential uh, in the way in which the glory motif uh, is intertwined with other things in the uh, farewell discourses is uh, the apocalyptic use of this terminology, that is the use in uh, uh, texts about revelations about God's will for the, the end time and for the restoration of, of justice and peace and um, all things good on, uh, on the face of the planet. Apocalypses celebrate um, God's glorious coming. Um, apocalypse is like first Enoch from the second century BC, which talks about all the unrighteous falling before uh, the glory of God. Hmm, we're going to see a little episode of that in um, the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, first Enoch um, in the parables of Enoch, probably written uh, later than the second century, maybe as late as the first century uh, CE, has the Messiah sitting on the throne of glory. Uh, the throne of glory familiar from uh, Ezekiel, as we've already seen. Um, at the end of the first century, roughly contemporary with the fourth gospel, there were several apocalypses written uh, reacting to the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem and wondering and trying to explain uh, how God's will is going to be um, uh, going to be possible after, after that horrible event and what the future of uh, Israel might be. One of these texts is fourth Ezra, um, and talks about the visibility of um, the glory of God on the day of judgment when God will come to make all things right. And the righteous will contemplate, will see and meditate on um, the glory of God that is revealed in that moment of judgment. Hmm. But Jesus doesn't judge. Well, minor point. Uh, we also have the Psalms of Solomon, um, probably written around sometime of the first century, maybe the second uh, that uh, uses uh, some of the same motifs. So it's out there in the Jewish world that the glory of God is going to be a major element in the end time transformation of things. Uh, in John, the eschatological revelation of glory uh, is a reality not in the future, uh, but a reality that uh, takes place uh, on the cross. So as we saw with the notion of resurrection in chapter 11, the notion of eschatological judgment, which we've uh, alluded to already, and the notion of the coming glory of God that transforms all things. All of these eschatological categories are used by the evangelist uh, of the death and resurrection of Christ 
the, the notion of realized eschatology or realizing eschatology uh, is at work here. Uh, that is, John is reflecting on what Christians have claimed and making a new package for these claims. Okay, so uh, that um, is, I think, a useful setup for um, the uh, Last Supper and the uh, farewell discourses. There's a lot here, and uh, I'm covering a good deal of, of territory, and I'm sure there'll be uh, questions uh, asked. I'm not uh, going to be able to go into detail in uh, a lot of these things. We'll pick out some important highlights in these uh, uh, passages uh, that I hope will give you a framework for uh, reading and understanding them as you go forward. So first of all, a little bit of an overview of what we get um, uh, in the Last Supper and the Farewell Discourses. Um, in terms of structure, I've been big on the notion that uh, John likes diptychs, uh, likes balanced uh, pericopes that uh, interact with one another in interesting ways. Um, there's a bit of a shift that takes place in the second uh, half of the gospel, and John, uh, or the Johannine editors, if we have more than one, seem to begin to favor more of a chiastic or ring composition. That is, uh, a series of episodes where um, the, the first uh, somehow corresponds to the last, and they all frame some central episode. Uh, this notion of a ring composition is um, uh, found in ancient rhetoric uh, or applications of uh, modern categories of study of uh, structure to ancient rhetoric. Um, it's, uh, it's there all over the place. It, it's there in ancient rhetoric because of the ways in which uh, ancient orators had to memorize what they were up to and uh, the speeches that they were going to give. And they organized their speeches by uh, framing them in terms of, of, um, uh, of architectural structures uh, that usually have some sort of arc-like frame and center on things. So it's not surprising that people who are in touch with uh, ancient uh, rhetorical or literary devices get into ring compositions in one way or another, or chiastic compositions. Chiasm is uh, the Greek term uh, coming from the letter chi, uh, has an X. And if you look at um, the way in which a ring composition uh, can be framed, it looks like part of an X. So. Uh, what we have here, uh, I think, in chapter 13 is a nice little diptych. We have the foot washing at supper scene, followed by discussion about the betrayer. Uh, and those two neatly balance one another. Um, then uh, we have the uh, farewell discourse that um, begins on the note of glorification. Glory is big throughout these chapters. And the love command. The love command. Uh, which is the point at which uh, glory is revealed and is the vehicle through which glory is revealed. And that begins in chapter 13, 31 and following. Um, then there's a dialogue between Jesus and the disciples that runs from the end of chapter 13 through the end of chapter 14. And uh, in this part of the dialogue, we encounter for the first time the figure of the paraclete. And we're going to have to spend a little bit of time on, uh, on that figure. And at the end of chapter 14, we have um, Jesus saying to the disciples, um, okay, let's go, time's up, which has suggested to lots of people that um, the, the farewell discourse originally ended there and was supplemented by the material that follows in chapter 15, six, chapters 15, 16, and 17. That may be so. Um, but in any case, uh, it, the, the addition of the material is by someone who has the, um, the same theological bent as uh, the person who's put everything else together and is working with the same set of presuppositions, maybe with a little tweaking. So it could be the same person who has decided he needs to balance something that he said before. In any case, what happens is the creation of a, a nice ring that focuses on an image, a pair of images, uh, or an image and a command, um, the image of the true vine and discussion of the love command again. So a diptych right in the center of this ring that, that's followed by more dialogue with the disciples in chapters 15 and 16, although the dialogue is not quite as intense as it is in chapters uh, 13 and 14. And another comment on the paraclete and the relationship between these two sets of comments on the paraclete is one of the things that leads many people to think, oh, maybe we have a, 
a new editor or uh, uh, the author rethinking some of his uh, material from before. Uh, and then finally, we have the prayer uh, for unity, the so-called high priestly prayer in chapter 17. So that's the overall shape of things. And I think it's useful to keep that in mind as you're reading uh, through this material. Um, the the um, stuff that we're dealing with here in chapters 13 through 17 has uh, different literary connections and evokes different kinds of literary forms. Uh, initially, and in the uh, dialogue materials of the uh, farewell discourse, it in, uh, invokes the conventions of symposia, that is, accounts of, um, of dinner parties and conversations over heady matters that goes back to um, Plato and Xenophon and continues down through um, antiquity, Plutarch, roughly contemporary with the fourth gospel, does a symposium. And then they, um, uh, the category is picked up by early Christians. We have in the third century, a, a bishop named Methodius of Olympus, who does a symposium of virgins, talking about uh, their virginity. Uh, love is a big theme in a lot of these symposia because it's there in the archetype of symposia, Plato's symposia, uh, where the issue on the table is what is love? And all of the people who uh, are engaged in conversation, they give a perspective on love from their own professional uh, point of view, uh, be it a philosopher, a dramatist, a doctor, who knows what, uh, or a prophetess who gives the uh, deciding uh, voice to what true love is all about there, diotima. In any case, there's a convention of having dinner parties where love is on the table and different points are made about what love is. In Plato, it's all about um, the relationship between man-boy, pederasty, uh, pederastic love, and the kind of love that Plato wants to advocate, Platonic love, uh, which is uh, creating beauty in the minds or souls of uh, the beloved, uh, different from the uh, loving that goes on in a lot of the other speeches of that uh, symposia. And this goes all the way to Methodius of Olympus, who talks about the love of virgins for virginity and celibacy. So love can be framed in different ways. Uh, but love is often a topic of symposia. Uh, another uh, literary form that um, uh, John is calling upon and using here is the form of a testament. That is um, uh, what someone says just before he or she departs from, uh, from life. Um, in some of the same plays on temporal categories that we find in, in um, the Last Supper discourse here are also found in Testaments. Uh, Deuteronomy is in some ways a testament and the form of testament became uh, very widespread in Jewish literature of the second, uh, second temple period. We have Testaments of the 12 Patriarchs, Testament of Moses, Testament of Job and several others. Uh, John 15 and 16 in particular, I think uh, the latter part of the, the, this whole business comes closest to uh, the testamentary uh, genre. And then the, there's at least a um, uh, connection with a theme that runs through uh, uh, consolation literature. Uh, that is literature that largely philosophers write uh, to people who have um, lost a loved one, uh, to a wife or, or some other person who has lost a member of the family. And a philosopher will say, relax, it's not the end, or, or there's a better hope for the person, or we all have this to worry about. Yes, but there's uh, immortality. So, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which one can offer consolation. Uh, but that too is an element of um, the literary tradition that John is weaving in. So all of these things um, get combined into the story of the Last Supper and uh, Jesus's last discourse. The Last Supper um, is uh, a meal before Passover. So not a Passover Seder, can't be, uh, because the Passover lambs are um, being slain on Good Friday. Um, so it's a different kind of meal from what we're uh, used to seeing in the Synoptic Gospels. And there's no broken bread or wine uh, used as a symbol of blood, uh, all, all of which are issues that seem to be have been dealt with back there in chapter six. And we talked uh, when we did uh, our analysis of that chapter about uh, how those Eucharistic elements, if we can call them that, work there. 
And because they're working there, the evangelist doesn't have to worry about them here. He has other things that he wants to put on the table, uh, namely the foot washing, uh, an act which he says is a necessary, says to Peter, Jesus says to Peter, is a necessary condition of, of fellowship with him. Is this an allusion to some sort of ritual that's a necessary condition for membership in the community? An allusion to baptism? Does foot washing simply serve as a symbol of baptism? Or is it something else? Well, Jesus gives an interpretation of the action and describes the action as an example, a hupodegma, an example of humble service. And that, it would seem, is what it is to be the necessary condition of relationship to God through Christ the acceptance of humble service as um, the um, essence of what God is asking one to do. The foot washing then is, is a very important sign, if you will, in the fullest sense of what sign means uh, for the evangelist. That is, it's something that conveys meaning at a deep level and one has to push to get that meaning. But at the same time, the meaning is right there if you look at it and see what's going on. Um, this is probably, in fact, a dramatic interpretation of a saying um, that we find in uh, one form or another elsewhere in the gospel tradition, either the saying about the Son of Man coming to serve and not be served that we get in Mark 10, 45, uh, or Luke 22, 26, saying uh, the one who serves um, is greater than the master. Um, and since Jesus has used the, the master-servant language here, it may well be that that's the form of the saying that's um, most relevant to the dramatic instantiation of the theme that we get here. Um, the action, in any case, anticipates the command to love um, that Jesus gives in 1334, that love command that will reverberate uh, in the, the later chapters of the, um, the uh, farewell discourse. And all of that, the action of Jesus and the love command and its reverberation, provides the interpretation for the coming passion and provides the substance of what the glorification is. That is the revelation of self-giving love is what um, uh, the death, but the life and death and um, uh, coming again of Jesus is all about whenever that coming occurs. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about that in a minute. So um, this um, chapter is I think very important for uh, setting up what John is trying to do in the gospel as a whole, that is offer an interpretation of the life and death of Christ, focus on the love command, uh, that is the essence of the revelation of who God is. Um, after that um, uh, episode, the, then we have the discussion of the betrayal, uh, which echoes synoptic materials. We can see how, uh, well, we have a balance here in, in, um, in the Johannine material between stuff that he's getting from other sources and inserting, reshaping a little bit, and stuff that he creates and shapes in a major way. Uh, in any case, the betrayal is um, uh, something that we find in the synoptics, uh, and it's all focused on Judas here. Um, and um, that betrayal is taking place, is signified in terms of uh, the symbol of darkness and light. Uh, the reference to the dramatic reference to it being night when Judas goes out um, si signals that whole business. Uh, and it's interesting that Peter is, is also uh, involved in the possibility of denial, anticipating what goes on in chapter 18 and his rehabilitation in chapter 21. So uh, when thinking about um, reactions to Jesus and um, the way in which different characters exemplify reactions to Jesus. It's important to note, I think, um, how uh, Peter functions in this text. Uh, John does not spend an awful lot of time on notions of um, reconciliation and forgiveness as does Luke, but he has this important symbol of it, particularly in Peter. Um, a little bit of um, uh, comic relief or maybe not so comic relief, um, as we're thinking about the foot washing. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, portrayals of the foot washing. This is um, uh, one by an artist, uh, one of whose pieces I've uh, shown before, that is the feeding piece that hangs in the uh, refectory at uh, Yale Divinity School. Uh, this piece by John August Swanson, another um, 
piece uh, with the same uh, kind of technique of uh, layered colors um, uh, is a uh, rendition of the foot washing. And there are several that he has, and some are much more conventional where all of the characters have beards. Um, here they don't. The only one who has a beard is Jesus. And how many of them are there? There were 13. And are they, are they guys or gals, one might ask? I think John August Swanson wants you to ask that question uh, and might want you to ask the question about who was there at the Last Supper and what kind of significance uh, did that have uh, for the future of ministry. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, one little interesting take on the Last Supper. Yeah, the foot washing, of course, has become something of a sacramental, uh, to use the technical Catholic term, uh, that is symbolic action. Um, that's not one of the seven uh, uh, divinely ordained sacraments, but it does something similar. Uh, other tra traditions like, like the Mennonites certainly uh, make a big deal of the foot washing, and it's become common um, in uh, Easter celebrations in many of our uh, different denominations these days. Uh, here is Pope Francis doing his version of the foot washing um, in a field uh, just within the last couple of years. The other thing that happens at the uh, Last Supper here um, is the first formal appearance of the beloved disciple. He may have been lurking around in some other places earlier on in the gospel, but he's certainly here. And where is he? He's lying in the kolpos or in the bosom of Jesus. Um, which, of course, is a typical uh, posture for someone at a symposium and at a Passover Seder. It's one of the questions that's asked at a Passover Seder. Why are we uh, here in this way? Well, because this is a special meal. In any case, this is the way people um, reclined at banquets in antiquity, at formal dinners. And so that's what John is doing. That's why he's on the kolpos of Jesus. Uh, he's at um, the proper place right by Jesus, so at the place of honor. Um, so the beloved disciple is right there by Jesus' side, imitating the relationship between the Logos and God um, that was uh, spoken about in the prologue, uh, where the uh, divine word that became flesh in Jesus had been in the bosom of the Father, or at the bosom of the Father. Might also echo Luke uh, 16, 22, where we hear the story of Lazarus, in the bosom of Abraham, uh, another echo perhaps of uh, the Lazarus uh, whom we encountered in chapter 11. In any case, the beloved disciple is here in that um, uh, position of intimacy, and Peter has to go through him to get to Jesus. So whatever Peter's position in the hierarchy of uh, leadership of the early church, at least in John's rendition of the Last Supper, he's in the secondary position uh, to the beloved disciple, whoever the beloved disciple is or whatever he represents. Um, keep that in mind as we just look at a couple more um, pictures of the Last Supper. Uh, here's um, uh, a more traditional uh, one from um, the uh, Renaissance. This is uh, Domenico Ghirlandaio uh, from the 15th century. Uh, and this kind of scene is often uh, replicated in art where you have the beloved disciple lying at the bosom of Jesus uh, in a way that made sense to the artist who didn't understand the practice of reclining a table where everybody is reclining a table in antiquity. So if it says that the beloved disciple is reclining in the bosom of Jesus, he, he must have had too much to drink or something, and he's, or it was too late and he fell asleep. In any case, there he is uh, lying down on the table. All right, uh, a bit of amusement, perhaps. Um, uh, interesting that in probably the most famous rendition of the, the Last Supper, Da Vinci's, uh, uh, which still hangs in Milan, uh, done in uh, the end of the 15th century, um, John, who is clearly to the our left of Jesus, his right, and is bending over to hear Peter's question. You see Peter's uh, hand, um, under the chin of John the Baptist, is he hitting, not John the Baptist, John the uh, beloved disciple, is he hitting him in the throat or is he pointing over to, John, uh, to Judas? What's he doing there? Whatever he's doing, uh, this is a rendition of the point where Peter is questioning the beloved disciple uh, about uh, who it is that's going to betray Jesus. 
<clears throat> and the beloved disciple is uh, there, a young man, um, handsome, beardless, etc. But he's not lying down on the table, right? Although Da Vinci thought that that was one way to represent the scene. Here's Da Vinci's sketches of the, um, the Last Supper. And you can see two versions of um, the beloved disciple uh, over here. Here you have more or less uh, what you get in the final version, young man, beardless, head tilted over, not quite far as tilted as he is in the, the other version. Here you have him as pretty much, he was represented in the Ghirlandaio uh, painting with his head on the table out cold, either, uh, you know, had too much to drink or a little too late. And in any case, uh, Da Vinci said, now nah, we got to get the Peter scene in. That's important. Why? Because it might say something about uh, hierarchy and maybe that's uh, something to be contemplated. Okay, uh, enough of uh, art history. Let's get back to the, uh, the farewell discourses. And in um, uh, chapter, uh, the first part of the farewell discourse, I'll call it part A, um, in chapters 13 and 14, before the pivot on the vine, uh, we have the dramatic pronouncement um, that involves the theme of glorification, right? The theme of glorification is all over the place here. Glorification is happening now, and in case you weren't aware of it. Uh, it's happening now when, when Jesus gives the command, the command to love, which he says is a new command. Is it new? No, it's there in the Old Testament. Love your neighbor as yourself. What's new here is love as I am showing you how to love, right? Uh, as I've showed you in the hupadegma that I've just given you, and as I will show you in the ultimate hupadegma on the cross, love in that way is what Jesus, I think, is saying in John's version of the love command. So the first round of the uh, Last Supper or the Farewell Discourse uh, talks about Jesus' departure and his promised return to abide in and with his disciples and his promise of an, uh, an advocate or paraclete. Um, so let's look at that and uh, go into it just a little bit uh, more in detail. At the beginning of chapter 14, uh, Jesus says he's going away uh, to prepare um, abodes for the disciples. Monai is the word which is related to the Greek word for remaining or staying, meno, um, which is the verbal form. Um, and that's not accidental. We saw the beginning of this play back in chapter one and uh, heard it a couple of other times along the way. And here it is in, in spades. It's all about abiding. Uh, but there may be some allusion to contemporary architecture too. Uh, this was a period when uh, apartment buildings were being built and multiple dwelling units were all multiple unit dwellings were all over the place. Um, and so there may be an allusion to that. Ah, in my father's big condo building, there are lots of good condos where you can uh, co domain, you could live together. Um, Jesus says he's going to return. When? Um, there are all sorts of predictions about the return of Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels, the eschatological discourse of Mark 13 which we talked about and thinking about the Son of Man has one of those, right? Um, John goes on and says uh, that there's indwelling taking place already, the Father in me and I in him. And so uh, I do what I do because of that relationship that I have with the Father. Note that what we have forming here is yet another chiastic structure, another framing of things. Jesus says in 412, I'm leaving, I'm going. Um, and then 415, if you love me, keep my commandments. This, in fact, is the condition for abiding. This is how abiding takes place, by hearing and obeying that command. Jesus, having said that he's going, says, but I'm not leaving you orphans, and I will come. Repeating things again. There's a lot of repetition uh, in this Last Supper discourse. He's coming back. How? As the Messiah at the end of time? No, he never quite says that, does he? Is he coming back as the paraclete? Hmm? Maybe, or maybe he's coming in some other way. He reaffirms, as he had already said, that he's in the Father, and that you, disciples, are in me and I'm in you. So there's a mutual indwelling. What does it mean? There's a relationship that has been established by his coming into the world, 
by his engaging with people in this way and by leaving this command that they love one another as he has loved them. And to make this quite clear, he says, keep my word. And then we, we, the father and I will abide in you. Um, the relationship depends upon your acceptance of this revelation and this willingness to keep this command. Um, the notion that Jesus is somehow abiding in the uh, hearts and minds of people who accept his, uh, his teaching is not new. We have that in a slightly different form in Paul, in Galatians 2, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. So John is not inventing something. He's given a new um, narrative expression uh, to something that was there on the lips of many early Christian uh, teachers. So he, Jesus says, I will go and will come again. How? In the life of disciples. John, in other words, um, uh, adapts eschatological hope, uh, which comes to be realized now in the relationship that people have to God through Christ, uh, through the example that they follow. Briefly on the paraclete, uh, we have, and then I think I'm going to call a halt uh, to it there and uh, take some questions, um, might pick up on the um, uh, the final prayer of Jesus next time. We have these two versions of um, uh, a reference to the paraclete. Jesus says in chapter 14, verse 16, I'll send another advocate. Parakletos is, uh, means called to one side, advocatus, called in. And um, like advocate, uh, paraclete is a legal technical term for someone who was called in as a legal advisor or an advisor who, or who provides other kinds of advice or consolation. Um, Jesus says, this is the spirit of truth. So we're not talking about some other human being. We're talking about the pneuma, the spirit. And what he will do will be to teach and remind. And what we have here, I think, is quite clearly just an interpretation of early Christian teaching on the, the spirit that's a presence in the community. Uh, more prominent in John than in the synoptics. Extremely important in Paul, where Christ, uh, the new Adam, is the spirit. Uh, or where the Lord is the spirit in 2 Corinthians. And quite prominent too in um, uh, Luke, both in the gospel and particularly in Acts, where the spirit is in fact an actor, a player in the drama who moves things along and determines how things are going to go. So the personification uh, of the um, spirit of God, which is an Old Testament term widely used for God's presence and power in the world, the personification of that um, notion is something that's been there. It's in early Christian uh, language, and John uses it here, uh, labeling it the paraclete. Um, the paraclete part two uh, comes up in chapter 15. Again, the spirit of truth, picking up the language of uh, verse 14, who bears witness. We have new functions according to the spirit, picking up themes that are prominent in John, and bearing witness is one of those. And um, the spirit um, also has judgmental themes. So the legal dimensions of paraclete language come to bear in John 16, uh, 8, uh, because the paraclete will convict the world as a prophetic judge. This is an edgier version, if you will, of the paraclete than what we had earlier on. And he's also a teacher who will teach in all truth. Uh, so what does the paraclete do? The paraclete does the things that the spirit was supposed to do in all of these other texts. He teaches, he leads, he pro provides inspiration for uh, prophecy that involves judgment on the contemporary scene. Um, and here, um, uh, the, uh, Jesus is in some ways an intermediary between the Father and um, the Spirit, but they're all somehow united. There's, if you will, kind of proto-Trinitarian doctrine going on here, but nothing quite like proto-Trinitarian, not, not like Trinitarian doctrine of uh, uh, late antiquity. Okay, um, we're at 7.50, and um, there's more to be said about the vine and the branches, which is at the center of the discourse and the wrap up, which is uh, what happens in the final prayer of Jesus in chapter 17. But I think I'm gonna call a halt here and uh, perhaps I'll say a little bit more about um, those pericopes next time. I want